Zombie takeout's always better with someone else around, you know. Hello and welcome to Zombie Takeout, the B Movie and Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And uh, hello, I'm, I'm Scotto. I, I did a whole NPR style intro trying to throw Scott off. It did not work. It'll probably be an outtake. Um, yeah. Before we get to this week's movie, uh, we have some listeners submitted from B- Bodo. This is a voicemail he left us. Hey, Bodo here. House. 1986. If I was you people, I'd make the mistake that I make and watch the Japanese version of the house. Toho production. Definitely, you can see some Godzilla um, after. Affleck, Malala, speech impediments, um, some of the Godzilla scenery that they use. Uh, it's definitely much better. It is um, subtitled, but they have a lot better movie, 90% Rotten Tomatoes, and it's worth every t- Rotten Tomato. Anyway, uh, what can you say? It has a little cheers, a little night chord, homage to Evil Dead 1 and 2, Tentacles, um, Twilight Zone, the movie, but none of the good stuff. Just all the cheesy crap. And I could definitely see where Snow Day got their zombies from. Anyway, not very good. I would rate it maybe two and a half brains. Anyway, you guys are the best. Glad you guys are back. Peace. Thank you, Bodo, and thank you for letting us know about the Toho version. Um, (laughs) Yes. It's from 77, unrelated, um, similar stories. Um, The Toho version, it's a schoolgirl who brings, like a high schoolgirl, who brings six of her classmates to her aunt's uh, house to avoid spending time with her creepy dad. And, of course, her aunt's turns out to be haunted. Um, So... Unrelated, but the trailer it, looks absolutely batshit insane, it, it so we'll definitely me, be reviewing it at some point. The trailer reminded me of that Monkeys movie we did, Head. Yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> Only like a horror version of yeah, Head, yeah, which yeah. Head really could have been a horror movie really True. easily True. if they had just changed a few things around. Mm-hmm. Also, Bodo left us another voicemail uh, letting us know that he was diagnosed with COVID-19, so we just wanted to say, you know, hope you recover quickly. Yeah. Yeah, no, I've had a lot of a lot of friends and family and coworkers mm. that have all, all been diagnosed, oh. and, you know, most have, uh, you know, had some pretty good, easy recoveries, oh, yeah. but, uh. you know, some of it's been a long time. I only, so far, Bodo's only the second person I know who's been diagnosed, the other being our friend Ruben. Um, who sailed to throw it. <laughs> I actually forgot about Ruben. Yes, Ruben had it. That's true. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, Boat is only a little bit older than us. I'm sure he'll be fine. Yeah. Um, anyway, on to this week's movie, which is from 1986 House. This kicks off the House trilogy. We're only doing the first three, even though there were four. I'm not sure why. I don't know either. You know, I don't even know anything about the third or fourth one. Mm. I didn't even know they existed until we started researching this maybe we'll do four maybe we'll actually slip the, the japanese one in after we'll see <laughs> just everything house related we'll do a tv show about <laughs> uh hugh Lurie show oh, we'll, uh, i don't know uh-huh. and of course that brings us to the impromptu plot summary sponsored by blood dance the latest novel by robert jacob it's a great book man you'll treasure it always and also brought to you by roger cobb novels in general uh is there such a thing as method writing all right, so we have, um, and they do, they take that uh, part, of the, part of The Shining where mm-hmm. it is an author just looking to, looking for some quiet, but he goes mm-hmm. into this knowing there's something fucked up yeah. about the house. Just to explain The Shining reference, one of my perspective titles was The Shining Light, L-I-T-E. Right, he, um, The Shining, of course, you know, that plot is... The author, you know, gets this gig as caretaker to the hotel, but, you know, he doesn't know the stories about it and, mm-hmm. and is kind of, uh, you know, blindsided by the evil that's under the place. Or was he? Oh, that's right. I forgot. Well, I don't remember that in the book either. I've read the book. Okay. The but... ending of the movie is different in the book. Hmm. Anyway. We're but, not talking about The Shining. That's right. <laughs> he, 
he this one he knows there's something wrong with the house uh and he goes in there fully with that full knowledge and uh well he, he of course picks up some more information while he's in there but he knows there's something wrong he's had really painful memories in there himself already but yet decides to go back in Mm -hmm. um and of course it lays out the perfect question of is the house really haunted or not even haunted really it's just there's something you know some sort of dimension door there it turns out you know i don't know if it's like a spoiler or not (laughs) and for a while they kind of play it off like it's it's just his imagination, but then his neighbor sees one of the monsters. Right. Until that point, you're not sure whether he's just crazy or there's something really happening, which they, they do a pretty damn good job mm-hmm. of, honestly, because he's acting pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When he goes on about raccoons and stuff, <laughs> he, he, he's out there. Um He's also having uh, Vietnam War flashbacks. Um, well, he, the book he's writing is his mem- are his what's based on his memories of fighting in the Vietnam War, right? But you kind of get the feeling he's having these flashbacks anyway, and he just has to write yeah. this to get this out. Because I mean, nobody wants a book about Vietnam is pretty much what his publisher tells him, and uh, but but he's insisting that he has to write it anyway. Although I remember eighty six and. At that point, and just before, every action movie show hero on TV was a Vietnam vet. Very true. Very true. I mean, uh, I think we're just getting into, like, the Rambo. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking Magnum P.I., A-Team. That's true. That's true. Magnum P.I. and the A-Team. And there were were a bunch of others. And uh, I think we're around the time of Full Metal Jacket Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the other one now. Um, platoon right like they're both out around the same time so it was just kind of like this glut of of vietnam Mm. war (laughs) but true as it came to books i think there were only maybe one or two that i could think of at the time Mm. that that everybody was really reading and it was more about the uh the generals or the higher-ups who finally wrote tell-alls at the time but anyway so he goes into this with the full knowledge his aunt killed herself um, in this house. He lost his son. His son disappeared from this house. And uh, you could tell things you know, pushed him over the edge and it led to the divorce of his wife. And uh, you know, so he goes into this to write his book and uh, I guess figure out what the deal is with the house. It's almost like he wants to solve this mystery. And of course, the the weird thing about this is it isn't just a, it doesn't, it turns out not just be a haunted house. There are just different forces in this house. Mm-hmm. And I think what made it interesting was that they were independent of each other. Yeah. And a lot of them seem to be specifically targeting him. Yes. He's he he meets a, a vision of his aunt, who tells him that the house tricked her, and, and you know it's it kind of plays a game with you, mm-hmm. and it tricked her into killing herself. Right. They aren't which, just you know, random ghosts reliving their deaths, or just you know random spectral fuckery. They are specifically targeting his weak spots. Right. It knows you, and it knows your weaknesses, and it's going to you know get you too. Mm-hmm. And then he see, you know, gets to watch her kill herself again, pretty much. Um, so there's a nosy neighbor that uh, is pretty much his only lifeline outside world. And probably he probably would have gotten killed had it not been for him yeah, yeah. in the end. Uh, he calls and tells he, he you know, visits him and you know, looks in on him, even though he doesn't really want him to because he's trying to figure out this mystery and maybe write a few things and uh he he winds up sneaking his telephone book out like you remember when people had those oh God. <laughs> and, not not the big bell telephone thick type but phone, phone 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 book his personal little address book yeah little address book that he left lying around on the table 
and he calls his ex-wife who happens to be like a soap opera actress and uh, which I, is the only way you realize uh, that the happy ending is imminent yeah because if she were dead and missing because mm-hmm. she appears to him and then turns into like some demonic creature and uh <laughs> if he had really killed her the production would be looking for her and would be suing somebody and you'd be on the news like actress well, yeah, missing true. and yeah there it's you know once, once you see that there's no like none of that you're kind of like yeah. is that was that really her <laughs> um but um he uh disposes of the body with but does he <laughs> mm-hmm. uh so he he goes through uh, and fights off a lot of the demons in the house uh it turns out to be the, the final heavy is his buddy from vietnam that he he finally reveals that he couldn't kill when they were um in the field and uh his, of course his, that left see i would ha- i kind of got the impression he was you know superior officer was was injured and and was saying kill me before they get me he couldn't do it and so his CEO got taken away by the enemy. Well, that wasn't his CEO. That oh. was just his buddy. Oh, okay. I kind of got the impression they were, on, they were outranked. They were on the perimeter themselves, and uh, yeah, he uh, right. He wanted to him to kill him. He wanted uh, mm-hmm. your greatest American hero to kill Bull. You know, Bull, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he couldn't do it. You know, they were kind of buddies, and he mm. just couldn't bring himself to killing his friend. And how do you do that? Yeah. You've got a knife. What's mm. the you know, least painful way of, of doing that to someone? How how much better is that than being tortured by the Viet Cong? And... <laughs> Speaking of as the person here who actually has a knife collection, I'll, I'll refrain from answering that question. <laughs> good, good. So, yeah, he takes the form of the final heavy and... Uh, he goes on a quest for his son to to recover him, mm. and uh, hilarity ensues. Mm. Now, the, the protagonist, as you mentioned, is is alluded to, is played by William Cat, aka the greatest American hero. Um, I, I in my trivia, I read that he had auditioned as for Luke Skywalker and was actually the front runner before Hamill showed up. Really? Yeah, he was being seriously considered, but Hamill ended up, of course, going to Mark Hamill. I think he would have made a better Luke. Honestly, you know who I had heard actually was a front runner for Luke Skywalker, even over him, mm. was Robert England. Wow. Interesting. Freddy Krueger himself. Well, yeah. I was actually going to go with the other reference, but the name, but I blanked on the name. Willie. <laughs> yes, Willie. Of course, Willie the friendly alien for mm. me. <laughs> <laughs> but back to the movie. Um, yeah, loved the kind of creepy, disjointed opening music and this weird, you know, affected images. Gives it a really good horror vibe right at the beginning. The the yeah, the whole celloy uh, intro. Mm-hmm. Although it it opens with this scene of this guy in a moped delivering groceries to the house, you know, but basically to find out that the uh, that is his aunt had killed herself. Yes. Um, he's only got one bag of groceries. <laughs> in early uh, 2021 that is hilariously quaint yeah but it is just an old lady you know just who knows how she probably doesn't eat much <laughs> there are two people living here we've got like we had a delivery yesterday we got like six bags sitting out in the front in the, in the sun porch <laughs> so you know it was just really Adorably quaint. Um, it was odd that they jumped from him looking at the house with his realtor to like this flashback of his kid disappearing, though. That really threw me. Yeah. The beginning of this movie, like the first about 20 minutes, mm-hmm. is very slowly paced. Yeah. And, and very strange, too, and awkward. It's not until, of course, George Wentz shows up right. that, like... <laughs> okay, now we know what this is going to be. Um, that it gets going. Yeah. Um, but they just jump to this flashback with no warning, and with no... They never tell you... They didn't. I think you mentioned he was divorced. Never mentioned the yeah. kid. So we get the scene where the kid disappears, and it's, all, it's just really confusing. It is. 
because you're like, wait, what is this now? Is this when? Mm -hmm. And I think I it wasn't until I read the IMDb some plot summary where it was he disappeared while he was visiting his aunt because uh -huh. oh, okay, he has visiting. like he has a room there though. Mm -hmm. Like they, they of course left intact. Yeah. Like it looks like a kid's room. I mean, would you would you really have that and just your aunt's house that you come to visit? Well, if if she babysat a lot and if they visited quite often, I could see that. Yeah, I guess so. Um, but the house, I'm sure, was pretty fucked up before mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And then you know they come out of the flashback. They, they, they him and the realtor start talking about the house again. The realtor picks up a harpoon gun. <laughs> damn near shoots him in the throat and then yes. says oops sorry oops, sorry about that <laughs> what <laughs> they're just very just casual about this near like... homicide yeah, he's just staring back at him like what the fuck <laughs> and and he's moving into this house where his son disappeared and then where his aunt hanged herself right that that's what I'm getting at like the Shining, I feel, Jack was ambushed. Yeah, you know? yeah true. Jack, I mean, Jack ending aside, you know, did not know. possible implications of the ending of the movie aside. Yes. Uh, but, but this guy signed on to face this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because he needed inspiration for a book about, or, or needed to, to buckle down and really focus on writing a book about his experience in Vietnam. Maybe he thought the haunting would bring out, you know, the horrors of war somehow. And he was, I mean, he was correct. He did start writing yeah. when he went in because he was not getting shit done. He right. was on the title page. Mm -hmm. Anytime they showed him writing, which he thought was just kind of like, a, you know, they just not want to show him writing. Mm -hmm. But no, he was just stuck. Yeah. And as a writer, I totally get that. Yeah. It was a very relatable feeling. Wrestling We're... with the blank page. Mm -hmm. Um, Richard Mall was a nice surprise because I I knew George Went was in the movie. I did not know Richard Mall was in it. Honestly, the only thing I can remember about the sequel to this is John Ratzenberger. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's got as long a part as he should, but John Ratzenberger fucking steals the next one if I remember. Okay, so but I it... forgot entirely that George Went and Richard Mall were in this, and thank God they were too. Of course, yeah. well, there's there's hope that the next one will be at least. Will be better, hopefully. Um, <laughs> and the, f the fact that he could turn off a hallucination with the TV remote kind of really <laughs> does suggest it's all in his head. Because <laughs> he's sitting there watching TV, he turns off the TV because I, I think it, it like switched to um, his his ex's soap opera or something. He no, he turns it off, and then he sees his son in the window. And it's clearly, like, it's static -y and it's clearly a hallucination. He grabs the remote, turns that off. <laughs> you know, I don't even think I noticed that. that he he turned the, the reflection of the mirror window off. I, th I guess I assumed he was seeing that in the TV, but... No, I watched the scene a few times to make sure it wasn't the TV, and it was... He had turned the TV off just huh. before. Um, it was just this weird scene they threw in. Now, I have to admit that the monster in the closet, the first time it jumps out, did startle me. That was it's, a good jump scare. Uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting looking creature that you mm -hmm. there. <laughs> Loved the camera setup he had to film it. Yes. 1985 cutting edge technology. <laughs> he had like six cameras lined up to try to film this monster to get it on camera, to, to get proof of it. He, he's kind of practicing. He's got, his plan is to use a string to open the door, and then the cameras are going to go off. And he, That might be one of the best-looking creatures yeah. that they had in this, too. Uh, like, oh, I mean, the demon yeah. towards the end was, a, was pretty... Was, wasn't bad. <laughs> but, like, the other creatures... I, I don't know. They looked, they looked they funnier died. than... Um, a total of seven monsters were designed and fabricated for the production. These creatures were constructed by 17 special effects artists over a period of three and a half months. The War wow. Demon, which I'm assuming is Maul's character at the end. Oh, yeah, yeah. You there's know, a I've War heard, Demon. 
um, didn't think about him as a as an effect. Was a was an elaborately built puppet measuring eighteen feet, fully mechanized, operated by fifteen people, and featuring a fully functioning working lower bowel low, fully functioning lower bowel system. Wow. So wait a minute. Would that be? You think that's uh, Big Ben, or do you think that's the the flying demon that he was in the pit? like against it's, they call it the war demon so i figured it was big ben yeah maybe you're right uh, yeah i, I think the 18 is feet is not you know foot to toe or you know or, or you know feet feet to head he was just yeah. you know he's richard moss height like you know six something um but i think there the the was it 18 feet was the additional stuff they needed to operate him probably okay I'm just guessing on that because he was actually, you know, the part we saw was only about Richard Mall's height, probably like six eight or something. Um, but um, the first, when they we first see that camera set up, he's practicing for trying to get this shot of the monster. He has the string in his hand. He lets it go and he mimes pulling the string to open the door, and then runs out of the house in fatigues. <laughs> vaults you know throws the door open vaults onto the fr- the sidewalk in front of his house with his hand up j- looking like the guy in the platoon uh box heart <laughs> right that and then of course went come just steps out and he sees him loved that it was hilarious he goes back into practice again and uh harold his neighbor george Mutt's character just kind of wanders into the room with a midnight snack. Harold just led himself into the house and went upstairs. I know. It was like <laughs> the doors. <laughs> Why would he lock anything? And okay, even if he left it open when he just he went back in, who just walks into someone's house and upstairs into you know one, into one of their rooms? He kind of thought that maybe George Went was going to be like a stalker, you know, since he yeah yeah was a fan and had tattered mm-hmm. pages in his pocket of right. a book, which was really he, weird. He was a big fan of Rogers. <laughs> yes. I'll also notice something interesting. Sandy's daytime phone number was not 555. It was 954. I noticed that. Always just, always surprises me when a number in a TV or movie, uh, a TV show or movie isn't, nine, isn't 555. Now, one thing I have to give the movie credit for, it predicted the big bass, Billy Bass. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's got this swordfish on his mounted on his wall that gets possessed, and it moves just like a big math Billy Bass. Now Bodo brought up about Evil Dead. Mm-hmm. This is before Evil Dead Two. Oh yeah, okay. What was the year in Evil Dead Two? Uh, that was like eighty seven. Oh wow, okay. I mean, this is after Evil Dead 1, of course, yeah. and I'm trying to remember... I don't remember Evil Dead 1 having all that many effects. No, no, it was mostly just the monster cam. Um, right. Evil, Evil Dead, Dead 1 2 was the serious... Was the hand and the... Yeah. yeah. Evil Dead 1 was the serious attempt at what they did comedically in Evil Dead 2 with a much better budget. You know, 1 had practically yeah. no budget, which is why we get the monster cam. It's right. mostly monster cam and, like, the tree rape, and that's it for effects. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, two had, like, the moose head laughing and the, you know, the hand and, and all the other crazy stuff. Right. Which, of course, this did the hand first, but I think somebody else did a hand before this. I mm-hmm. can't remember who. <laughs> I mean, the possessed hand is kind of, I mean, the hand, the movie we did with Michael Caine. Oh, right, right. You know, that it, it, it's how it probably goes back to some Poe story. <laughs> I mean, you could say the Adams family yeah. started it. It's kind of an obvious idea. Um, <laughs> now I'm nitpicking here, but the scene yeah. where you you know you think he killed his ex-wife because she turned into a demon. When he shoots her, and she's on the pavement, he picks her up. There are no exit wounds. No, there's no blood. Yeah, I mean, you would think that there would have been blood on the pavement. Point somehow. blank with a shotgun. No exit wounds. I mean, I don't know much about Edgar guns, Allen but Poe scene. Hmm? that that scene with the cops was very Edgar Allan oh, Poe, yeah, yeah. Telltale Heart right. with the the cops. You know, oh look at this. Yeah. 
Well, that George Wendt comes in and mm-hmm. bites himself into. Right. It, while his supposedly dead wife is is sitting in the sh- in the basement, um, yeah, and there are two shotgun shells, you know, that he dropped on the kitchen floor. <laughs> but but with the the de- of course the demon comes back. You know, the the wife, the demon that his wife turned into, comes back and terrorizes him again. Earlier, there were these possessed garden tools that were chasing him around the house. He closes this one door to stop them. He opens it again, and they go after the demon that had possessed his wife, or was impersonating his wife. This these shears just behead her. Love that. Very Bugs Buddy, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's... The, the one thing I have to say about this movie is they did... You know how a lot of times I use this as a criticism against a movie mm-hmm. where it didn't know what it wanted to do, right. and it, like, it was all over the place? This movie was all over the place, but somehow made it work. <laughs> like, it's suspense thriller, it's horror, it's mm. comedy. Yeah. Like, those are three really ambitious things to try to tie together. Well, horror and comedy and, are fairly common. Well, now they are, yeah. Well, that's true. But this how... is one of the early ones. That was right. kind of an 80s thing. Right. They were... I mean, they weren't going for a Zucker Brothers thing. Right. I mean, they were just going for some slapstick, you mm-hmm. know. I, I mean, it's post-Toxic Avenger, I believe, isn't it? Maybe by a, a year or two. I think Toxie was 85 or 84, maybe. 84, yeah. Okay. So it's just around the same time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, so, but, I mean, there were other Kaufman movies before right. this where, you know... Mm-hmm. they gave it a bit slicker look and and that that crazy slow time in the beginning kind of does pay off in the end because you wouldn't give a fuck about any of these people if you didn't know what the situation was true but yeah then to like bring this bugs bunny stuff in the middle of it you're just like wait what mm-hmm. <laughs> though i do have to speaking of that beginning part just briefly i do have to criticize the wardrobe a little bit because he's walking around in this ridiculous v-neck sweater with no shirt on underneath they were clearly just trying to show off william cat's pecs like it goes down to his breastbone just look no, ridiculous it's the 80s man yeah true there's, there's a, I, I had a sleeveless shirt somewhere well, i had plenty of muscle shirts it was a thing i mean I, I pushed myself around in a wheelchair i got decent arms so why not show them off but you know but a v-neck down to like you know the breastbone with no shirt on yeah i guess that is kind of it's actually a 70s thing yeah um but it it held over i guess now there was another b and e i gotta point out um his another one of his neighbors a woman just showed up in his pool one day right like she was just randomly swimming in his pool one day well wait a minute we just passed over one great scene from the movie okay it's the weird juxtaposition of him hiding what might be his ex-wife's mm-hmm. body <laughs> that he dismembered uh-huh. into many different pieces in his backyard with the Linda Ronstadt song, Yeah, You're No Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's in, he's in the middle of doing that when the neighbor, you know, he sees the neighbor in his pool. And so he's got, you know, the body in a bag. Or in, yeah, and then you know the the neighbor reveal you know she, is tense. She's in his pool and explains that you know his aunt just let her swim whenever she wanted to, so she just let herself in. And the neighbor is literally a Bond girl. Yeah, <laughs> like she was just in a view to a kill. Oh, okay, <laughs> right before this. Uh-huh. Um, love that you know after he kind of shoes her away. We cut, there's a little bit of a time jump to the to when he's done with the burying, and there's like one bag turned into like eight holes. Right, at least. I mean, it just goes throughout the whole. There's nothing but. I, who could count all the, the hills that were in the mm-hmm. yard? It was so obvious if he was trying to cover it up. Also, um, loved just after that, the, the this neighbor brings her son over so he can babysit him. She's basically right. just trying to use him. Right. You think she's flirting with him. He's going to get somewhere. And it was really just 
to to make him a babysitter, which of course you found the worst babysitter in the world. Yeah, yeah. He's already lost one kid. <laughs> True. Um so when they show up at the house, the um demon hand, the hand from the demon that his wife turned into, is on the kid's back. Well, first the dog freed and the dog was introduced early on. I love how they introduced him in the garbage can. And then brought him back to torment him again by finding the demon's hand. Right, right, right. right. And then the hand ends up on the kid's back. He's he 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 has this whole big French farce where he has to like shoo the kid away. The kid goes running. He has to find the kid, and you know somehow get the hand off before his you know, the neighbor sees the kid, the hand on the, her son's back. Ends up in the bathroom, pulls it off, throws it in the toilet. I would not have believed that that hand would fit down a toilet if we didn't see it actually go down. The water pressure that place is fantastic. That's <laughs> kind of when I figured out why he wanted to actually live at the house. Because mm. if you have a place with water pressure that strong, <laughs> you fucking hold on to it regardless of what kind of demon <laughs> is uh, playing around with it. Uh-huh. Loved the little clip of the soap opera that Sandy was on. They did a great job parodying soap operas. <laughs> yeah. And and Roger sending Harold after the quote unquote raccoon. <laughs> yeah, once he brings George Went into the uh mm-hmm. the whole yeah. what's really going on thing. Right. <laughs> and it's... that's when Harold sees the monster and proves it's not all in Roger's head. You kinda wish he, they had done it earlier, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh just to have more time with them going up against the demons of the house. Mm. And that all leads to another flashback, because, because, um, of course, uh, you know, Harold is supposed to shoot the monster with the harpoon gun from earlier, misses completely. Roger gets pulled into the al- to the dim- other dimension. Um, has the that's flash- when they finally figure out. They, they, that's like the first time they they give you a hint of what's actually going on here. Mm-hmm. Is that he's pulled into another dimension, or, or, I mean, you think it might be his mind, but it's it's really another place. Yeah. Well, the fact that Harold saw the demons does it proves that it actually does exist. Yeah. Um, but he gets pulled in, and this is that's where we get the scene where he won't shoot his his buddy in the war. We get a Richard Mall almost death scene, which is brilliant. Yeah. He comes back. Um, Harold sitting there with. With a bottle of Jack in his hand that is mostly empty. <laughs> he just passed out. I think that's a pretty reasonable response to seeing that monster. Yeah. Um, and, and Maul being the big bad was a really nice surprise. Because he had been kind of underused up to this point. Definitely, yeah. I mean, the, it's just the origin story. And, mm. and yeah, he's introduced as the bad way too late, though. The heavy. Yeah. But... It kind of worked, I think, because what else could you do with them? I mean, that chase could only last so long. True. You know, that that couldn't have been more really. They, sorry, I just hit my mic. Sorry if it made a noise. Um, that that chase between the two of them couldn't have gotten on much longer than it did. It would have just gotten That's kind of true. tiring. Um, the the big demon at the end, uh, the other one, mm-hmm. like when when he's going after his son. Uh, I love how. He twirls the shotgun. Fire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like you're not expecting this. I mean, you're just expecting him to be demonic or whatever, or claw or slash. But he grabs the gun out of his hand. And you think it's a defensive thing, <laughs> and instead he twirls it. Around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like he's in a western. <laughs> and starts plugging away. Yeah. At Roger. And of course, he rescues his son from the other dimension. Um. And you know, the ex-wife shows up to see him. I'm glad they didn't get back together. Yeah. Although, I mean, who knows? You I mean, know? They left the door open. Maybe they did. Yeah. You, you can have whatever headcanon you want. But in the context, in, in the space of the movie, you know, the, the kid just runs out to his mother. They hug. You know, there's a little smile between the two of them. That's it. You know. Yeah, I... I... Maybe it's just, I mean, the way the world is right now, but I didn't mind the happy ending, actually. Well, that's That happy ending was nice, you know, because the whole thing was about the disappearance of his son. 
he found out the kid, and it, I, I think it was pretty obvious that the kid had been pulled into the other dimension. Um, it, it is like he because he beat the house. Yeah. You know, he gets the prize kind right. of. You know, he gets to put his life back together. Mm-hmm. I mean, the other. I mean, it's like a game of consequences. You know, either he gets his life back together or he winds up killing himself in the right. house. Right. But you know, they didn't go for that obvious plugged-in tick-the-box romantic ending. True. Which I was happy about. True, not just fitting in a so maybe we should go have dinner sometime. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, the door was open. There this story is done. If you wanna, you know, just if if that's where you want them to end up, that's fine. But they like, didn't... I don't think he's in the sequel, no. No. I think this is Cat doesn't come back, I think, until the third one. Which brings us nicely to sequels and remakes. Yeah. Um, it was followed by three sequels, House 2, Second Story, which we'll be revealing next week, House 3, The Horror Show, um, that we'll be doing the week after that, House 4, The Repossession, maybe we couldn't find that online, maybe that's why we didn't do it? I don't know, I we'll did, like I said, I didn't know the other two existed. Yeah, we'll look. Um, House 3 is not a direct sequel, but I'm pretty sure I read that William Cat does come back for that one, he's not in the he's next either- one back in three or four i'm yeah. not sure which one yeah, he's not in the next one um on to brains on to brains i liked it but not quite enough to recommend three and a half it's it's a weird little movie i mean it's got so much in it and uh i think they strangely make it work together and of course it's i think mall and went are worth the price of admission so i'm going for all right and what have we learned how ironic is it that Maul had to grow his hair from Night Court to play a soldier? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, Maul was, I mean, like I am now, bald in Night Court, completely shaved. So, yeah. You know, he had but, to have a little know, he's bit. playing a soldier. Uh, I think you're going to have to grow your hair out a little bit yeah. for that. <laughs> and I learned that shotguns can kill things that are already dead. Because <laughs> the swordfish was flopping around, he, he shoots it. And the swordfish stops moving. That was his boomstick. Mm-hmm. All right, that's it for House. Until next time, we'll be when we'll be continuing the trilogy with House Two, the second story. Always remember, never forget wherever you go in life. There you are. There you are. Hello and welcome to Zombie Takeout, the B movie and cult movie show. I'm John. And hello, I'm Scotto. Didn't even phase you. <laughs> <laughs> I did like a fucking NPR thing. You didn't even react. <laughs> I, I was like, wow, he's going for something different in 21, you know? No, I'm just going to take that again normal way. All right.